Good morning. So this morning we're, we're talking about a recent um, data coming from the ICD Sports Registry, and I'm delighted to be joined this morning by uh, Dr. Tess Sorrell and Dr. Bruce Wilkoff, who were uh, co-investigators on this paper. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Sorrell, perhaps you'd like to begin by giving us the highlights of, of what the uh, data shows. Uh, yeah, so the International Sports Registry finished uh, data collection and included a total of about 379 patients followed for a uh, mean of a little three and a half years. Okay. Um, of those, about a third were under age 21, and they inc it included patients who played competitive and dangerous sports, um, and we looked at outcomes. Um, the primary endpoint was any looking for people who died or needed resuscitation because of arrhythmias during sports, and there were none, no, no primary outcomes. Um, secondary outcomes were lead failure rates and also um, need for multiple shocks during sports. We also had no change in lead failure rates compared to the general population of patients with ICDs, and we did have a couple patients who had multiple storm events although that was not dissimilar from my population overall of, of young patients with ICDs. Okay. So overall it showed it, it can be safe to participate in athletics for some patients who have ICDs. Okay. So while the uh, guidelines tend to be very restrictive in terms of uh, young athletes with ICD, these uh, new data suggests that in certain populations this may be uh, safe to participate in sport. Um, Dr. Wilkoff, in light of these uh, data, uh, how has this uh, changed your management of young athletes with ICDs? So in many ways it hasn't changed things because it's more about the disease process than it is about the defibrillator as to whether they participate in these activities. But this data gives us something to, to stand on, something to, to talk to our patients about, something to talk to other physicians about, which allows us to say, well, you're not likely to harm the patient uh, more than, you know, whatever life is, is going to harm them. It's not going to harm the defibrillator, and the patients are going to be protected. And while the events will occur, they're going to happen at a normal rate, and the patients are going to do relatively well. So this gives, gives me some confidence that what we had thought intuitively was appropriate, maybe a little bit more liberal than what the original Bethesda guidelines went, has some substance to it, and that we can talk through this with our patients. Because when in reality, what we're doing is we're counseling the patients, we're encouraging them, helping them to make decisions, but we really can't stop them and can't and wouldn't. I mean, I think this is the point of having a defibrillator is to help them to live with their disease yeah. so that they, if there's that one moment in time when they need it, it's there, but they can go and back to living their life. So this really informs the conversation that we're going to have with our, with our young athletes, um, but obviously we still have to keep in mind what the underlying pathology is and, and also what the sport that they're interested in playing is, and maybe some uh, high-impact sports are still not uh, a good idea, and there weren't too many of those in, in the original paper. Uh, so I'd like to thank you both uh, for coming this morning, um, and that's it. Thanks very much.